So this session is a workshop session, um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it takes to start keeping your pipeline, deployment pipeline running as it starts getting bigger and more complicated. The, 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 the idea of a de deployment pipeline and of continuous delivery in general is that we're going to start using automated testing to validate what it is that we do. And we're going to use those automated tests to kind of drive the, excuse me, to drive the development process. Uh, and inevitably, what that means is that we're going to start creating more and more tests. So over time, it's going to be harder and harder work to be able to run them all. So somehow, we've got to find a way of staying on top of that and keeping them running. And ideally, we'd like to be able to do that without ever imposing any doubt on any development team's mind to think, I shouldn't really test this because it'll go too slow. So we want everybody to always feel free to add more tests, but at the same time, we've got to optimize to try and keep those tests running quickly and efficiently. Uh, and, and really, that, that's what this, this, is, this is all about. This is meant to be a workshop session. Um, I have got a presentation, as you can see. I'm going to talk to that. But, and mostly this is going to be me talking. I'm not, I'm not going to be doing lots of different workshop exercises as part of this. I'm going to be talking about some of the ideas that you might want to think about. But please do feel free to make this interactive. Please do feel free to interrupt me if I'm not being clear or if you'd like to ask a question about what I'm talking about or for any other reason. I have a very bad habit of talking too much. And if you let me, I'm just going to talk at you for an hour and a half. So <laughs> let's try and avoid that. Let's try and make it interactive. And, uh, and then we'll have, all have more fun uh, as we go in. Um, so um, I, I showed this picture in my talk earlier today, if you were there. Uh, and this is the, the kind of the stereotype that I tend to use of a deployment pipeline. This is actually the minimal deployment pipeline that I think of. I think that in order to qualify, I can't imagine writing any project so simple that it wouldn't need this. Uh, it, you know, it, this, is, this is my minimum deployment pipeline. And the idea of this is that fundamentally this defines the core of my testing strategy. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to want to give development teams fast feedback on the work that they're doing. We want to be able to evaluate every change as quickly as we possibly can and get an answer back to the development, development team saying, yeah, that's good, carry on. Um, but that's not enough. That's not enough to be able to release the change into production. We also need to know that the software does what the users need it to do, that it's deployable. That it, and so we need acceptance testing as well, which is a different kind of testing. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those things as we go through. But we're going to need those in addition. And then it's a deployment pipeline. So the job is to produce something that's ultimately releasable into production. And therefore, we need to be able to deploy the results of our work into production. So this is what I'd build in the first iteration or the first sprint of the fir for the first story on a new project. This is the easiest time to build this at this point. And making your software testable and deployable, that the job at the point at which we're creating the deployment pipeline at this point in the life of a project is uh, we want to start as we mean to go on. We want to be able to give developers feedback on those early stories, but we also want to kind of set the, the, the rules and the scope of work so that it's easy for people to do the right things. We want development teams to start growing their software based on automated testing, evaluating its releasability in, in terms of automated testing. So let's start there. Let's start while it's easy. Um, the last time I did one of these from scratch, I did it as a demo. Uh, I did it in GitHub Actions for a very, very trivial walking skeleton of a, pro of a, of a web project, which had a, a web page, a couple of fields, and a database. That, were, those were the first, that was the first story. And I built a deployment pipeline. And it took me about a day and a half to do the whole thing. So this is really easy to start at this point. Later on, if your system is big and complicated, your deployment pipeline is probably going to get big and complicated. 
but right now it's really easy. So this is a nice place to start. And even if you're retrofitting this to an existing piece of code, I'd start pretty much the same. Get these, thing, these fundamental pieces in place, and this is a good starting point for, for, for any project, really. It sets you off on a good footing. <clears throat> The more general picture, the, the, the picture that I more regularly use is this one. And this is based on the deployment pipeline that we built, uh, the LMAX project. Um, and it's meant to show uh, the more sophisticated pr picture. Actually, the LMAX pipeline was more sophisticated than this because lots of these stages were running in parallel. They were running copies in parallel so that we could optimize to, to run more tests. Um, and so some of these things, so there were, there were multiple uh, deployed environments in the acceptance test stage, there were multiple deployed environments in the performance test stage, there were multiple deployed environments in the um, commit stage as well for, for, for to get feedback quickly enough in this more complicated pipeline. In recent years, I've started to think about this in a slightly different context to that which Jez and I wrote about in the continuous delivery book. That doesn't mean that the continuous delivery book is wrong or out of date, but, but there's, there are some new takes on, on how this might work. So the first thing is, is, is what I've already said, that the first phase of a deployment pipeline is what I call the commit cycle. And this is strongly focused on supporting the development teams. Uh, the objective at this point is to give early, fast feedback and a high level of confidence in the developers that their if all of these tests pass, then their change is probably good. So I usually advise organizations that I consult with and teams that I work with to aim for very fast feedback from this cycle, feedback in under five minutes. Actually, the evidence suggests that 90 seconds is ideal for build feedback, but you have to go quite a long way. If it's a big system, getting feedback in 90 seconds is, is quite a lot of work, but that's the ideal. But those are the kinds of numbers we're looking for. What we're looking to do is to try and really lower the barrier of entry uh, so that we can get really fast feedback and, and really limit the amount of pauses in the development process while somebody's waiting for this validation. What we want is that we want developers to commit a change, wait for the results of the, of, of the commit cycle, and if all, all these tests pass, they're going to move on and they're going to start working on something new. And so this is one of the most important parts of the deployment pipeline to optimize for fast feedback. This is one of the places where it's worth investing time, money, engineering effort to, to get really fast feedback at this point. The next phase is something I talked about in my talk this morning, is really about determining the releasability of the change. And in this phase, we're going to do whatever it takes, given our project, to determine that releasability. As a minimum, as I've already said, we probably want to run acceptance tests. And these are behavioral tests, usually written, uh, often commonly described as BDD tests. Um, but the objective of these is to define what a user wants of the system. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to capture a desirable outcome. We're trying to identify some feature of the system that a user would like to see added. And, and it can and probably should be ideally a small feature, a small increment in the behavior of the system. But we want to capture that idea, that goal, if you like, that target, without saying anything at all about how the system is going to achieve it. So we don't really want these tests to say, fill in this form and press this button, or call this message, or add this column to a database. Those aren't really behavioral assertions. Those are design choices. That comes later. At this stage, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to assert an outcome, an outcome from the perspective of an external user of the system, and we're going to evaluate that in a production-like test environment, given realistic scenarios, real realistic patterns of use. If these tests pass, they're going to say, yeah, that does what, what you intended, that does what the users want it to do. I've recently come, again, this is a, a, a new, new way of thinking about this for me anyway. I've recently come to think about this part of the process as a translation process. 
So what we're going to do is that we're going to start out with kind of a vague wish from the user's point of view. I wish the system did this. That's, kind of, that's where we're going to start. We're going to then take the next small step into a slightly form, more formal way of expressing that in the form of a user story. And then we're going to identify a series of examples that if those examples existed, would demonstrate that the needs in that user story existed in the system. And then for each of those examples, the next step is we're going to create an executable specification that defines that that example exists in the system. And that's going to guide our development work, is, is the way that I prefer to, to, to organize things. This is straying a little bit off topic, but I just wanted to paint the picture of what it is that I'm talking about when I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about a deployment pipeline. This is very strongly uh, 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 you know, organized around sort of BDD style thinking. And there are some things that BDD misses in terms of the test, testing that we might want to do. But this is a good starting point in terms of thinking about defining things. And it's a good way of communicating and maintaining that understanding of intent all the way through the development team and the development process. And then, whatever else it takes, is it secure, is it resilient, is it scalable, is it, is it regulatory compliant, whatever it takes, we're going to try our best to automate all of those things. Our goal is to eliminate any dependence, as far as we're able to, on manual regression testing, because that's too slow, too inefficient, to be frank, too low quality, compared to, to running tens of thousands or millions of tests of different kinds. So we want to eliminate dependence on manual regression testing, but that doesn't close the door on other forms of manual testing. So we might want to include manual exploratory testing as part of the development process, as part of the development team, happening in parallel with the developers working on the changes, looking for things like, is the software nice to use? Are there any dumb things in, in, in terms of you know, uh, UI layout, that kind of stuff? But those aren't really gates. We're going to automate all of the gates in terms of rele releasability. And our, the job of our deployment pipeline is to be definitive for release. If the pipeline passes all of its tests, this change is releasable. That's our goal. That's what we're striving for. <clears throat> the last phase is the production phase. And this might be very simple. If you're just building a simple web app, you might be just be you know, dropping it in, dropping a container and starting up a container somewhere in the cloud, or it might be incredibly complicated. Netflix, for example, track the Terminator on the planet. They look where it's night time, and then all, on an automated basis, they choose data centers where it's the middle of the night to release new changes. They constitute something called a canary index, which is a measure of the success of the change that's tailored at that, to that particular change. And if that canary index if you don't meet the goals of the canary index in the middle of the night, then they pull the, the change before it starts to become prime time in that time zone and they stop it being rolled out in other time zones. That's pretty sophisticated stuff. There's quite a lot going on here. The other part of the production cycle, at least in the way that I think about it, is kind of the observability of the system. Monitoring the system in production, I've just described what Netflix do, that doesn't work unless they're monitoring what's really going on. I quite like um, site reliability engineering as a model for this. I, I don't quite like the way that people often talk about site reliability engineering quite as much. Site re reliability engineering, which is Google's approach to DevOps, uh, is, is extremely good. But mostly when people talk about it, what they talk about is technical measures of success. And those aren't the only kind of experiments that we want to do in production. So. One of the, the ideas that I really do like about SRE is the idea of service level indicators and service level objectives. The measuring the success of the develop, delivery of your software is really, really important. But it's hard to find generic measurements that make sense. The DORA metrics of stability and throughput are sensible generic measures, and you probably should build those into your deployment pipeline. Stability is measured by change failure rate. How often does you, you releasing a change in production introduce a failure into production? And mean time to recover. How long when you discover that change does it take you to get back to a stable, fixed result? <clears throat> um, throughput is measured by the other DORA metric, 
is measured by lead time, that is how long does it take you, essentially how long does it take you to cycle around here, how long does it take you to go from commit to something releasable, and how often do you exercise that by actually deploying into production. These are measures of quality and the rate at which we can produce software at that quality. These are really good things, they're pretty generic, they're hard to game. So I would recommend that those are a good choice. But beyond that, it's pretty hard to generalize. So for some kinds of change, the site reliability indicator, the, the service level indicator that, that we're interested in might be something like uptime or latency or throughput, those kinds of things. But for others, it might be how much money do we make or how many customers do we get signing up or other kind of more business-focused measures. What I'm saying is that this is contextual for every different feature, not just every different project. So for every, in an ideal engineering context, for every feature, we say, we'll know that this feature is successful when we see the, we're going to measure the success of this thing based on this scale. How many users we get, how much extra money we get, whatever it might be, how many sign-ups we get. And then we're going to set an objective. If we can hit this number, that's going to count as a success. If, we, if it's not, it's a failure and we've got to do more work. That's a service level objective. This is a really good model for monitoring things in production. And this might be part of the production cycle. So this might be quite complicated. <clears throat> the pipeline in the... Yes, certainly. I went back too far, but carry on. Yep. So we always end up in testing a subset of the data within the deployment pipeline. Yep. And in production, definitely the data, the constraint, the load, everything is different. And we end up finding the issue of that particular only in those constraints. Yes. So what do you recommend? Would, should deployment pipelines ideally have production like data? I, I, I think it should be production-like, but not production. I, I don't, for exactly the reason that you've just pointed out. What many teams do, I, th I think many teams in this context, from my perspective, optimize for the wrong thing. They optimize to kind of minimum, minimize the amount of work that they do on testing. No. <laughs> Test everything that can go wrong, and that minimizes your work in terms of development. That's a, that's a better way around. So, um, so, so I... I I think that just playing production data through the system is not good testing because usually what you're doing is that you're taking a cut of production data and you're just winding it through the system. And he said, when you think about that, it's just kind of a sampling exercise and it's a sampling exercise of reasonably normal cases. I want to start testing things when things are under stress or when things go wrong. How does this component work when it can't make a connection to this other component? I want to test those sorts of things as well, the failure cases. Those are the points where most production failures happen. The commonest place in code, this is based on academic research, the, pro the commonest place in code where systems fall over in production is in exception handling. And the commonest line of code at that point says, we should do some exception handling here. <laughs> so testing that kind of stuff is important. Evaluating those kinds of exceptional cases. And for that, I think that you need to get the system precisely into the state that you want to be in to be able to then exercise those behaviors. So testing those corner cases, I think, is important. And pro just replaying production data doesn't do that well enough. It should be production-like enough so that the scenarios that you're playing are realistic. But, that, but, but that's not the same thing. So my preference, certainly for acceptance testing, um, is to um, always use th synthetic data. So stuff that's inspired by, if you like, the production, the production data, but it's not the production data. It's, made, it's generated by the test at the time that the test is running. There are some tricks to do. This is probably beyond the scope of this workshop, to be honest, but there are some tricks to doing that um, to use the data to isolate tests so that you can run them in parallel and all of those sorts of things. I, I might try and just point those out if, 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 I, if I can fit those in when we're talking about optimizing things. I pressed the button too many times when you, when you said I was back on the previous slide, but there you go. So those are the cycles. Um, 
As we start working in this way, the deployment pipeline becomes a more and more important strategic resource. Um, we're going to use the deployment pipeline to be definitive for release. All changes flow through the deployment pipeline. My preference is if you're going to upgrade the operating system, it goes through the deployment pipeline. If you're going to reconfigure your database server, it's going to go through the deployment pipeline. If you're going to, I don't know, change the schema in your database, it goes through the deployment pipeline. Every, every change to production goes through the deployment pipeline, and in my ideal situation is that there is no human access, no human right access to production systems. So this is the only way that you get to change production, is ideally the, the way that you exert best control, in my view. Um, and that means it's important, because essentially development stops when this is broken, or too slow. So thinking about it in those sorts of terms, we're going to start to need to start worrying about keeping the deployment pipeline working and keeping, keeping the information flowing through, flowing through it. Here are some of the common places that might be problematic when we're building our deployment pipeline. So a slow commit stage can have a big impact on development because this is, this is what drives the development process. If our commit stage is slow, developers are going to start backing off and committing less frequently. That means that the, si the size and complexity of the change goes up. That means it's a bigger deal when something goes wrong. So keeping the changes tiny and small and incremental is the, is the better way to go. My preferred way of working is with test-driven development and continuous integration. So. I'm going to write a test, run it, see it fail, write, write some code to make the test pass, run it, see it pass, refactor the code and the test, and at that point, I'm probably going to commit the change and trigger the pipeline. So I'm probably committing, just me, in a t as part of a team, I'm probably committing once every 10 or 15 minutes, just me. So the whole team is going to be pro producing change frequently, and so we don't want the commit stage to be flow because, slow because that would that would if it takes more than five minutes to get the result back from that, that commit stage, I'm going to wait for longer. I'm going to say, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't commit to the pipeline yet because I'll have to wait too long. Oops, sorry. <coughs> Next, slow acceptance tests. These are big, complex tests. The aim of these sorts of tests is to deploy the system into an, envir a, an environment that's like real reality in production and to evaluate it in lifelike circumstances. These sorts of functional tests, people have been trying to do these kinds of things for literally decades and often with poor results because they're hard tests to live with. So there are some things to get right to make that work, but also they're complicated, so they're going to be slower. They're going to be more costly in terms of time. And this is one of the reasons why I tend to break them out in, in the pipeline as a separate stage, because it gives me op opportunities to optimize the fast stage, the commit cycle, differently to the, the acceptance cycle. And then there's failing tests. How do you deal with failing tests? And intermittent tests, even worse. How do you deal with intermittency? And last of all, there's changes to the pipeline itself. If I introduce a change to the pipeline and it's not properly version controlled and managed and so on and I can't step back to safety and it breaks, I've just compromised the whole releasability of the system. And for a big team, that's a really big deal. I've just stopped everybody working. Not only have I stopped them releasing, I've really stopped them changing things as well because it's very scary once you get addicted to this stuff to start changing stuff without the, the safety net of all of those tests running all of the time. So let's look at those in turn. So the commit stage is here, and these are the kinds of things that are very common in building a commit stage. We're going to probably need to compile the, the system if it's a compiled language, um, run some unit tests of some kind, maybe some analysis tests verifying our coding standards or data migration tests or whatever else. And at the end of a successful commit build in the commit stage, we're going to build the installers, the installed images of our system, Docker images, um, um, Kubernetes um, uh, uh, images, DLLs, executables, jar files, whatever our deployed unit of software is, we're going to build it. And from then on, that's what we're going to deploy and test in all of the rest of the stages. So. The ideal feedback cycle for this is under five minutes, as I've said a few times now. And so 
what can go, what can start to compromise that? Well, well first, compilation, if we've got a compiled language. Uh, and so one of the things that we can do is that we can spend time and effort and, and money on making sure that our build scripts are efficient. There's something weird in software developers. We seem to take our brains out of gear sometimes for some kinds of work. And this is one of the pieces of work that we seem to, to take our brains out of gear. We might agonize over by building nicely structured, well-designed code, and then we build spaghetti meatball mash of build scripts that, that are inefficient. I consulted with a client a couple of years ago, uh, and their release process was to run the build seven times because the, there were so many circular dependencies in it that the first six times didn't produce a, a deployable result. <laughs> so they had to run it. It was only after seven times of running the build that all of the stuff had compiled correctly, which is just insane <laughs> if we're trying to be in, in, if, efficient. So thinking about re, uh, rewriting things is, 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 worth thinking, is, is, worth, is worth doing. The other thing here is that, the, as I said, this is one of the most valuable pieces of real estate. So buy faster hardware if it takes this. I, was, I, was, I worked for a um, financial trading organization. To be fair, they were pretty wealthy. Um, and that we had a problem with a very large C++ build. The build and the running the test took nine and a half hours. <clears throat> and so they did an overnight build. Um, every morning they'd come in and they'd look at the, um, the results of, of the build and they'd cherry pick the components where all the tests had passed and they'd allow those to be released into production and they'd discard the components that had failed any tests. Um, that was okay as long as the bits that were green didn't depend on changes in the bits that were red and sometimes they did so they were releasing broken code into production sometimes. Um, we, optim we did all sorts of things, all of the things that I'm talking about here. We did all of these things to try and optimize this build. We, tried, we, re we rewrote the build. We bought faster hardware. I went to my boss and say, we need bigger hardware and, uh, for, for the build. And he said, OK, how much is it? And I said, it's going to be $150,000. <laughs> and he said, OK, <laughs> which surprised me. But we built really big hardware. We ran things. We, well, I think it's one of the things I say later. We ran the build off RAM disk because that was faster than uh, SSD or any other way that we could do it. And C++ builds are I/O bound. We did whatever we could to optimize this, and it was worth it because, uh, in the for the three years that they'd been running the overnight build, um, I was told that there had been two occasions, maybe three occasions, when the whole build had gone green, that every or every test had passed. In the first two weeks after we got the faster build, including the faster hardware, we got two fully green builds. And from then on, after that, every day, we had at least one release candidate where all of the tests had passed. And we just picked the newest release candidate, and we'd, we'd release that the following day. Just optimizing this stage with no other changes is a fantastic tool for improving the quality of the system. Um, so invest in it, buy faster hardware, do whatever it takes. Parallelize the build. Modern hardware is phenomenally good. Modern incremental build techniques are phenomenally good. Start to parallelize things, and we can go really fast. You can think about the, 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 the solution that nearly everybody jumps to is to think about decomposing the system into more independent modules. But this is actually more complex than it looks because you, the danger here is that you find yourself in dependency hell. Um, I had another client that I worked with over a series of years who were building some complex system. They were building scientific instruments and they were building everything from the firmware on the devices to apps in the cloud and everything in between. Um, and they they said there's no way that we can do our build in the sort of timescales that you're talking about, so we're going to break it down into a series of services, put them into separate repos, work like that. And they did that, and they got the build, they got the build feedback from those things fast, 
But for the next 18 months, they were fighting a losing battle of trying to identify a change set that all worked together. And that was taking weeks and months to do. So they were still not in continuous delivery world in terms of being able to produce something releasable every day. So if you want to try, if you want to try and get there, be very wary of this as a solution. The way that this works is when you can get independently deployable pieces. But if they're all, all together, I think the easiest strategy is to optimize the build um, to, to just get the feedback. And if you use the sorts of techniques that I'm talking about here, you can do massive builds in, fo in five minutes with, with most languages. <clears throat> Look to modern build systems. The incremental build systems and distributed build systems that are available now are phenomenal. Um, Basil uh, and Buck are respectively the build systems that are used in um, Google and Facebook meta now. And what certainly Buck does is it has a distributed cache. So if a developer has compiled a particular piece of code on their workstation, that's now in the cache and it's available so it doesn't have to be get built again. And that's reliable. So, so this, the, these can be extremely efficient for extremely large builds. Uh, Google has, does trunk-based development in a single repo with 9.5 billion lines of code and 25,000 developers. So you can scale quite effectively if you apply the engineering effort to this. <clears throat> try, running the, uh, try running tricks like like measuring things and running the build from RAM disk or whatever it takes to just try and optimize the build, understand what's going on. You might need to bring in some expertise to, to do some of these things, but if this, this is all a worthwhile investment if you've got a large build and this is pro part of the uh, problematic for you because this is a good place to speed up. <clears throat> Certainly older languages like C and C++ are amenable to, 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 the, to these sorts of techniques because they, they were designed um, a long time ago and the comp comp compilation is slower than more modern lang most more, more modern languages. The next thing that's likely to be slow is the tests themselves. Um, and so the first piece of advice is look to the tests. <clears throat> Try and figure out whether they're fit for purpose. Often, um, tests are written as a kind of afterthought. And one of the downsides of writing tests after you've written the code, rather than writing the tests before you write the code, as in test-driven development, is that the tests tend to be more complex and more <coughs> coupled. One of the big advantages of test-driven development is that it forces us to write testable code. <clears throat> It's kind of obvious, really, because why would we, st we be stupid enough to make our own lines harder by making the test, the code that we haven't yet written, hard to test? Of course we wouldn't. What we're going to do is we want to make our lives easy by at the point at which we write a test, we'd like the code to be easily testable. And that means it, drives the, 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 um, it reduces the complexity of the test and the code. And testable code also has many of the properties of high quality code. It's more modular, it's more cohesive, better separation of concerns, better abstraction, looser coupling. All of those things that are the hallmarks of high quality in code. So we can use the testing as a tool to drive better design, but we can benefit from the better design by making our tests more efficient as well as a result because our code is more easily testable. <coughs> Commit tests. On the whole, the vast majority of commit tests are best captured as pure unit tests. Pure unit tests don't talk to disk, don't talk, start other processes, don't start the application, certainly. Don't talk to a database, don't talk across a network. They're, they're in process with the code that they're testing. They're, they're right up against the edge of the code and they evaluate the code in controlled circumstances um, and that can be blisteringly fast. If for these kinds of pure unit tests, on modern hardware, you can easily run hundreds of thousands of such tests uh, in, in five minutes. Easily. <clears throat> 
and probably many, many more without doing much more than just sort of throwing them in and running them. So pure unit tests are the ideal kinds of tests for this stage. There's a lot that they're not going to do, but what they are going to do is that they're going to validate that the code's doing what the developers think the code's doing. And that's a good step forward because nearly 60% of production failures are caused by the common mistakes that we as developers all make in software, off by one errors and conditionals the wrong way around and scoping problems with variables, all that kind of stuff. We just eliminate those kinds of failures when we do test-driven development and do these sorts of tests. There are times, though, in the commit stage where, you know, as well as wanting fast feedback, we want a high level of confidence that if, if, the, if all of these tests pass and we let the pipeline continue, then what we want is that most of the time the pipeline is going to say, yeah, it's all good. So my general advice is that we're looking for two things from the commit stage. We want feedback in under five minutes, and we want to achieve about an 80% level of confidence that if these tests all pass, everything else will be good. It's easy for us to measure that in the pipeline because we can just count the number of failures and, and, and determine the ratio of the failures. So we can monitor that easily. But that's what we're trying to do. But So in order to get that 80%, the, the, these two ideas are really in tension. We want high level of confidence that all is good and we want the answers really fast. So <clears throat> we want lots of tests. So occasionally there are tests that will tell you something that you're not going to find out any other way that might be really slow and painful. So that's okay but accept them grudgingly. Be, be very cautious. Be very aware of just how valuable that five minutes of time is to you. This is, as I keep saying, this is amongst the most valuable real estate in the pipeline. So be very, very wary of letting anything in there that's too slow. Um, there are some teams that I speak to that just put all of the tests in the, essentially in the commit stage. That's fine if you're building a really simple application. If you can get the results for your application for everything that determines the releasability of your system in under five minutes, then cool, lucky you. <coughs> Personally, I'd still organize it with a separate acceptance test stage and run that alongside so that when my tests grow and they become slower than being able to run them in five minutes, I can start doing other things and other optimizations, which we'll talk about. But that five minutes, I think, is, is, is important to try and aim for. And you might not always hit it. The, the, the war story that I told you about the big C++ build, the nine and a half hours, when we'd done all of our work, we'd got the commit stage down to 12 minutes. We couldn't do better than that, whatever we did. And everything else was giving a result in 40 minutes. <clears throat> so be careful about how you, how you accept um, slow tests in the commit stage, or anything slow, really. <clears throat> it's worth always thinking about efficiency and breeding the culture in the team of considering the efficiency of the tests to some degree. If we're testing code, we don't need, I, I don't, there is at one level, I don't really believe in over testing. I want to test everything that can go wrong in my system. But that doesn't mean that I need to test every variable. I, I, I might test the edge cases where the, 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 the values in the, in the variables are extreme or, or you know, normal cases, but I'm not going to test every potential uh, variable. Um, there's a, an idea like chicken counting. The, the joke is that count, chickens can count one too many. So, so use that in, uh, in the design of your tests. If your tests include loops, then don't loop for a long time in a test. That's just wasted effort. Why do you want to do that? Just to, to trying the thing out twice is, is, is enough to check that you're, you've got a list or whatever it is. If you really want to be extravagant, three times. But... Don't loop for hundreds of thousands of times. It's just waste. Use mocks and stubs as a way of faking out expensive interactions uh, and just giving very quick results. This is quite a good way, particularly when you're starting to test towards the edges of the system, to fake out interactions with, uh, 
I.O. devices primarily that are going to slow you down in the context of a test. So you abstract the I.O. and then you test to your abstraction and get really fast results that way. <clears throat> Periodically, it's worth sorting the tests by duration. So you can monitor that in your pipeline, <coughs> figure out um, which tests are slow, and then have a test performance day, day. have the team focus on just taking them off the, the stack in order and trying to find a way of making that test operate more quickly, more efficiently, the, the slow tests. And you'd be surprised how effective that can be if everybody's just focused on doing that periodically, just going back, thinking again about how to test this thing more efficiently. Uh, and that's a worthwhile effort. <coughs> and run tests in parallel again. This is, this, this is difficult if your test isolation to put is poor, so don't allow your test isolation to be poor. Um, but otherwise, it's really easy. If, you, if your design's reasonably good, if you've not got global variables, if you're not sharing state on the disk or something like that in the scope of tests, you can run these things in parallel very easily and very effectively. And modern build systems will help you to do that. As a last resort, if you can't find a way of speeding up the commit stage enough, then look at those slower tests and just consider maybe moving them out. Are they really telling you something that's worth the time that you're spending on them? Um, maybe just move them out to a later stage of the pipeline where you, where you can afford the cost of those tests a bit more easily uh, and, and defer running them. This is one of the things that we did when we were doing the big C++ build. Um, uh, we, just, we just cheated, basically. We, we did an analysis of all the tests. We defined any test that ran under two seconds as a unit test, and any test that ran over two seconds as an acceptance test, and we optimized them that way. It's not ideal. I wouldn't recommend it as a starting point, but tactically, practically, pragmatically, in a real-world scenario, it will move the game on for you. The next part of the commit stage testing is analysis tests. I like to do various kinds of static analysis. As a minimum, I'll usually um, fail a build if, if the, coding cha the code change doesn't meet my coding standards. I usually turn the compiler warning up to the top level and fail the build if I get any warnings in, in, in the errors because I want the logs to be clean. Those sorts of things. That's, those are hard to retro... Certainly the, the second one, but the first one as well, they're hard to retrofit after the fact because you'll find lots of mistakes in the code and, and you'll be a big cost of correcting them. But they're a good way of starting off a new pipeline. Um, and that can be really valuable. There are other kinds of analysis that, that, that can help you. You may choose to assert architectural patterns. You could say, in this tier of code, we're not going to allow any, any libraries that access a database, for example, in, in the UI tier or something like that. But different things. You could have a, an include and an exclude list of different resources in different parts of the code base or whatever else you, you cared about in the scope of your tests and, and, uh, and validate those and fail the build on those kinds of things during the commit stage. This can be really useful, but if it's too slow, it's not worth it. So prefer kind of relatively lightweight lint style checks largely rather than deep code analysis. Uh, checks. The analysis, these sorts of static tests, they need to pay for themselves. They need to be finding bugs because if they're not, if they're slowing down the, this very valuable time in the commit stage, they're not worth it if they're not finding bugs. So they need to, they need to be useful with any of these sorts of analysis tests because they are more costly usually because they're, they're, they're looking over the whole, whole usually whole of the code base or parts, large parts of the code base. As a last resort, you can move the analysis testing into the slower stages, the acceptance phase of the, of the pipeline rather than the commit phase. 
The other last resort is just decide to bin them. If they're not giving you useful feedback, if they're not detecting defects, then they're not paying their way. Uh, I, I'm not somebody who lightly advocates to developers to delete tests because I think that's a really, really bad idea. And some, sometimes some developers are too prone to, de to delete tests when they fail. That's a bad mistake. But in this circumstance, you know, if you're taking the, you know, a considered view and the test is more costly than the value that it's providing, you've got to really make the hard choice, I think. The installers for our software that we're going to create at the end of the commit stage, um, we want to be able to test our software in lifelike circumstances. So we want to rehearse the deployment as though we were going to re re deploy into production um, and using the same tools, the same mechanisms, ideally close to the same configuration in our test environments for this. Um, and we want to test that release into production. This picture, I think, is a real picture of a man testing a bulletproof vest. Presumably, the man that's being shot at is the inventor of the bulletproof <laughs> vest rather than one of his employees, I hope. So the output of a successful commit stage is a deployable unit of software, and, and, and we want to do that. The good news, that might take a while to assemble to that, that deployable unit. If it's big and complex, if you're doing this for a big legacy system, the assembly of the deployable thing is sometimes a costly thing. You can look to optimize that, you can look to speed that up, you can look to modularize it and parallelize it and all sorts of different techniques, but um, for some kinds of technology, it can still be difficult to achieve. Um, at this point, um, if creating the installers are slow, it's a relatively low impact to move this out of the commit stage because this is not the kind of thing that breaks very often. You're not going to break the building of the final deployable unit if you've already compiled all the code, um, run all of your tests, and it all makes sense. This is not usually a fragile part of the build process. So you, you can more easily defer this. Remember, you're still now adding that to the cost of the acceptance stage, which we're also want, going to want to optimize. But it's not quite such valuable real estate as the commit phase. There's um, one of my ex-colleagues, Dan Bodar, who's a very, very smart guy and very amusing, was bored on a project some years ago um, and decided that he was going to see how far he could take these kinds of ideas. Um, and he optimized the commit build on his project so that it took 10 seconds. This was a big Java project, and it took 10 seconds to do it all. He, can, he tells the story in this blog post here. Uh, I, I will make the, uh, the, the, the slides available to the organizers so that they should make them available to you. But, but it's, uh, it's surprising how far you can take this if you take this stuff seriously and work at it hard enough. Dan's pretty good at this kind of stuff, so this is a rather extreme, but you can take this quite a long way. So in summary for the commit stage, the performance of the commit stage is vital to encouraging good behaviors in our software development process. We want people to work in these smaller steps to get fast feedback, understand where they are all of the time, and, and the commit phase is, is, is what's going to do this. So fundamentally, commit, the commit phase is just continuous integration. It's continuous integration plus building our deployable artifact, but it's continuous integration. So we want to optimize to have great continuous integration as the first part of our deployment pipeline. As a grumpy old man, it's one of the reasons that I feel slightly grumbly about saying CI/CD rather than just CD, because we're saying we're saying CI twice, because CD includes CI in my mind. But that doesn't matter, that's just me being grumpy. There's a link between the ability of teams to keep the build green and how fast this goes. Go back to my example of the C++, the large C++ build. 
an overnight build. Think about that for a moment. If I'm a developer and I commit a change that introduces a defect, I'm not going to find out about that until the following day because the builds run overnight. Now, if I, know that, if I know what I did wrong, if I did something really stupid and it's absolutely obvious to me what I did wrong and I commit immediately, it's not fixed until the day after that. So your real cycle here is twice the duration of your pipeline. And if you are waiting for a day and half of that, you know, double, double that time is the time when stuff is broken in reality, what you're going to do is that you're going to find it really, really hard to stay on top of failures. My gut feel estimation of looking at projects like this is that if you have an overnight build, which is pretty good by most standards, if you have an overnight build, you're probably going to have 5 or 10% of your tests that are always failing. There's a random 5 or 10% that are always broken. So you're not getting a clean signal about the releasability of your system because now you've got to guess, is it okay to release when that test is failing or not? And you don't want to be there. So bringing this within the working day, bringing this so that you can have multiple tries within the working day is one of the reasons why I suggest optimizing for a really fast commit stage. Now I've got several attempts at trying to fix problems if I introduce a problem, and that means by the end of the day, I'm almost certain to have, have, have corrected any problems that I've introduced. Treat commit stage performance as an important thing. Optimize for it, assign development effort to, 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 to achieve it. Spend money on, on resources. This is a worthwhile investment in the, in the efficacy and efficiency of your development process, to my mind. The next stage is the acceptance test stage. So this is the first part of the acceptance cycle. This is the stage where we're going to run these, these uh, tests that kind of define the, 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 the utility of our software from a user's perspective. Usually, the, the kind of the, the pseudo code for the commit stage looks vague. Sorry, the acceptance stage looks vague like this. We're going to configure the environment in some way. We're going to deploy the release candidate. We're going to get that up and running. We're going to just check that it's ready for use, and then we're going to do whatever it is that we want to do with it. Um, ideal fight, feed, feedback cycle for this is somewhere in the region of about 45 minutes or less. We want, ideally, we'd like the whole cycle to complete in under an hour. This is another one of those things that gives, if we can determine the releasability of our changes in under an hour and we introduce a defect, we've got, now got two or three goes at fixing any problems that we introduce during a working day, usually on average. And so that's going to allow us to largely keep the build green. Slow acceptance test. test. We, 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 the way that I prefer to work, as I described earlier, is to use acceptance tests to guide the development process. We're going to cre create these executable specifications before we start work on a new feature as part of the development of, of this new feature. Um, and so um, that if this is the, the efficient, we're going to grow lots of these tests because we're going to build these tests for every new story that we write. We're going to end up with lots of these. I'm not a big fan of the testing pyramid that say, you know, say that you should have few UI tests and a few more integration tests and whatever other tests and lots of unit tests. Certainly lots of unit tests, but probably also lots of acceptance tests in my worldview because they're important, they give us different parts of information and they help us to drive the development process. One of the ways of thinking about this is thinking, it's, it's one of the things that we can, um, can be slow is the configuration of the host environment itself. Now this is alleviated to some degree with modern system, more modern cloud-based tech like Docker, Kubernetes, those sorts of things to some degree. But it's worth thinking about. So it's worth thinking about the rates of change of different layers. So uh, if you're deploying um, you know, uh, some regular software running on a version of an operating system, you're probably not updating the version of the operating system quite as fast as you're up updating the application that you're building. So that's changing faster. So you'd like, you'd like that to be very efficient, even if it's a bit slower to up upgrade the operating system, just as an example. 
there are different ways that we can use to, to, to optimize that. But thinking in terms of the layering and tuning the, 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 the configuration of environments using the layers in those environments is a useful strategy, particularly if you're not working with cloud native technologies for any reason. So we can use things like layering the configuration. You had a question. I, I, I want to evaluate the system through the natural interfaces to the system that the, u, the end user would use. So if it's got a UI, I prefer to test through the UI. I'm okay with using other APIs or interfaces to the system if they're genuinely public interfaces to the system to populate the system, to get it into the state ready for the test. But if the interactions that I'm testing are through, normally through a UI, I want to test them through the UI. Um, I want to test the system as though it's being used by real people. Um, and my, my guideline is to write acceptance tests that test via public entry points into the system. Uh, I don't want to, be, but what I mean by that is that I don't want to build back doors into the system just to support the testing that I want to do. I don't want to go in and put some test data directly into a database that backs up my software. I want the database to be populated with, through the code that populates it in real life because th otherwise I'm not testing reality. Um, so um, I, I think that's where, and you know, there might be times where you kind of compromise on some of these things a little bit, but I would strongly recommend that the, the safest stance is to always test through the public interfaces. I think there's lots of things that are talked about you testing through the UI being slow. And for some things that might be true, but it's not as slow as, as it seems. The Almax case, I, I showed a picture this morning in my, in my talk this morning that showed the numbers of tests in different stages. And we had somewhere in the order of about 20 odd thousand, 22,000, something like that, acceptance tests for the LMAC system. A large section of those, thousands of tests, tens of thousands probably, were going through a web-based UI because that's how people were interacting with it at that point. Um, and we could get a result in under 45 minutes from, from, from that phase. So, so I, I don't think it's always costly. You do need to think about the performance of these things. It's, you know, it, of course, but you know, it, it, it's worth thinking. It, it, I'd rather not break encapsulation if I can avoid it of the system. Yes. I don't think that integration tests, for me, integration tests aren't part of the strategic decision decision for testing. So um, the, my test strategy is based around acceptance testing and test driven development. Um, for many systems, that's all you need. The acceptance test, if you think about what the acceptance tests are, we're going to deploy all of our system that we're responsible for. We're going to test that through its public interfaces in lifelike scenarios from the perspective of an end user in a production-like test environment. This is like a super integration test. This is testing the system integrated as it will be in production. Uh, it's also like a staging test. So we don't need a separate staging environment either because we're evaluating our system deployed as it will be and configured as it will be in production on the whole. So this kind of fulfills multiple purposes, which means that it's quite an efficient way of working. We're using these things as specifications. We use them as a way of communicating into the development team the intent of the requirement, um, these executable specifications. And we're using these executable specifications to guide the development process in terms of we're going to do TDD, TDD underneath until the specifications are met. So all of these things add up, and we get an awful lot of value out of this one, one type of tests. For me, the role of other types of tests are more tactical. So if there's some particular aspect of my system that I can learn more quickly with some integration tests, I might do that. But it would just be for those things. I don't, 
I don't, the integration tests for me are not the kinds of tests that you have for every, every feature that you develop. You have them occasionally when you have a specific, particular need that they teach you something that you don't, more quickly that you don't learn elsewhere. Mostly, the acceptance tests are going to cover the ground, I think. So we can think of layering our configuration. We can think, think of things like pre-baked templates. This is one of the techniques that Netflix used for a long time, where you kind of you, you, you pre-populate part of the environment, and then you just layer in the, the application changes to, to pre-prepared environments that you took off the shelf. Um, modern technologies like Docker images solve some of this problem generically because they, they have a layered version control system built inside of the, a, a Docker image. That may not, as I said before, that may not always be enough if you're doing this for a legacy system and you can't use Docker for some reason or if you've got particular needs, the generic solution in technologies like Docker might not be completely optimal. So there might be other opportunities for you to speed things up if that's a difficult thing. But now we're getting into technical edge cases really. So using containers like Docker or Kubernetes and those sorts of technologies are an effective way of managing this part of the problem and managing the, the, the layering. And then you can keep these Im images and use images off the, self and off the shelf and then populate them with changes and then snapshot the image. And you can, it's a good way of uh, optimizing for things. Successful deployment ends with a running system in production. And so for efficiency, we need to configure the time to deploy the system the time to migrate any data that the system uses, and the time to start the system up and get it up, up and ready for use. Optimizing all of these things is sometimes worthwhile, um, but certainly considering them, because what this does is that this kind of puts, defines the um, theoretical limit for how fast you can get results from your tests. Let's imagine for a moment that compute and money are unlimited, um, then the, the limiting case for how fast you can get results from acceptance tests is that we could imagine deploying a dedicated version of the application for every single acceptance test and running all of the acceptance tests in parallel against their own dedicated version of the app. If we were to do that, then the, max, the, the, the minimum duration of the test would be um, how long it took you to deploy the your, your, your application into the test environment, get it up and running and ready for use, and then the duration of the slowest test. So after that, you just defi decide how close you can get, depending on how much money you want to spend on, on test hosts. <clears throat> so, so it's worth thinking about these kinds of things, I think, if you're in this kind of game of trying to optimize the things. There's also then the time, the time to validate, the time for the test to run, of course. So, Keep deployable artifacts lean. Don't carry too much weight. I did some consultancy for a client in Silicon Valley, and they, they were complaining that it would took too long to deploy the application into production. They were and when we looked, they were deploying 114 gigabytes of data, and that's quite a lot of bits to move around. Um, when we looked, though, 112 gigabytes were some test data that they were lugging around everywhere, and so were useless in nearly all of the environments. So just discarding that has just sped the build up. So just think about these kinds of things. Look for ways in keeping, keeping these things as lean as possible. Don't carry too much stuff around as the, the deployable image for the system. And try and keep the artifacts lean. Try, try not to produce vast um, uh, deployable artifacts if you can avoid it. You can start thinking about um, packaging strategy as a tool for allowing you to, to deploy things. If you package things appropriately, you can then start thinking about parallelizing the deployment. Um, think about network infrastructure and those sorts of things, whether that's a constraint. It might be something interesting that you want to test, but certainly in your test environment, optimizing your network infrastructure and your environment to allow you to shift the bytes around that represent the system quickly and efficiently is worthwhile thinking. And again, kind of caching builds and stuff like that, getting them closer to the point where you're going to run them when you want to run them might be an option in some kinds of uh, environments, particularly if you're doing the layered um, configuration. <clears throat> Minimize data sets where you want. This goes back to the question about using 
production data. Production data is usually too big and unwieldy. So use targeted data sets for your testing, and, and that tends to make, make life a little bit easier, and these sorts of tests a bit more tractable. And think about better modularization of the code, again, along with the packaging, and maybe deploying the system in parallel. Try to avoid dependency order, ordering between the parts of the system, so you can start the system up, and when all the pieces get ready, it's ready it kind of knows it's ready for use, and you can start, start quickly. <coughs> uh, I've already talked about that. It's worth, it's worth making this part of the code efficient. This is commonly not a place where we think of making the code efficient. But actually, there's lots of nice properties of, of having your system that, that's able to start up quickly. Not least, if something bad happens in production and you need to fix it and then get it back up and running again, it's going to shorten that time. So it's quite a healthy sign if your system can start up quickly. And there are lots of things that we can do to, 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 to improve the efficiency of this part of the system very often. I've talked about that already. I'm, I'm whizzing a bit because I've just realized I'm, I was talking slower than I thought I was. There's a common cycle here um, with uh, acceptance testing in particular because acceptance testing we're using to drive the development process. We're going to be writing acceptance tests for every new feature of the system. It's just going to grow and grow and grow as we develop more so software. What tends to happen is we start off small. We start off with a, a few of these tests. We usually run them on the same server that we run the, the, the commit tests originally because it's, that's, there's loads of spare capacity. At some point, we'll have added enough acceptance tests where the build's starting to slow down a bit. It's getting annoying. So we'll move our acceptance tests off and we'll, we'll buy a new server and we'll run our acceptance tests on a de de dedicated host environment and server for, for, for those tests. And then those will do okay for a while. And then we'll add more and more tests. And then we'll get to the point where that starts to slow down as well. What usually happens at this point is that we buy ourselves another server. We double up. And <laughs> nearly every time that a team that I've ever seen, they start off by just manually dividing the tests up. Every test that starts with the letter A to M runs on the first server. Every one that starts with, <laughs> with the rest of the alphabet runs on the second server. And then they watch that and they find out that one of them always finishes before the other. And so they start tinkering and moving the tests around to balance it out and to try and, to try and optimize that for a bit. And then we get some more servers. We, we double up again. We get four servers. And then that starts, starts to get painful, all that balancing and making, messing around with tests and keeping it aligned. At some point, we're going to want to think about probably automating the allocation of tests to environments to try and optimize this process a bit more effectively. Um, we can do things like test avoidance. We can try and track. I'm always a bit wary of this, to be honest. So people are better at, the, at this than I am. I've never been able to do this to my own satisfaction well enough. I'd rather just optimize to run all the tests really fast. But test avoidance can work, and particularly at massive scale. If you can say this change here never impact, you know, this change to this part of the code here never impacts the, these tests, they're not related, and we don't have to run those tests. But I think it's sometimes hard to be able to do that. Um, so I'm a bit wary of it. So be careful that you don't spend too much time. The last time I tried to do this, which to be fair was a long time ago, we analyzed it, we, and we literally our build was spending more time analyzing where to run, which tests to run than it was spending running the tests. So, so be careful what you're doing. If we do all of these things, then we're able to scale up easily. If we, if we do, if we, if we, if we care for about the way in which we work these things, what we can start to think of now is that we can start to think of tricks like sharing out the cost of deployment of, um, of, our, of our system between many tests. We, we're going to run many tests in parallel or sequentially in a shared environment, and effectively we're immortizing the cost of deploying the um, the application and getting the environment ready. So now, when our acceptance test environment becomes free, it goes and looks for the newest release candidate, it deploys that, and then it spawns out a, a whole bunch of test hosts that can then evaluate in parallel against that shared environment. This is quite a good strategy for optimizing. 
and we can collect the results at the end of the run. And that's, that's another way in which we can start to really scale things up uh, and really start growing our ability to, to get fast results. This scales quite well. This is, a, this is an animation of, um, uh, of the LMAX system allocating tests to different test environments. Um, on this part, uh, this is the normal case. So this is one environment or, or several environments that are shared between multiple test hosts and so multiple test cases running in parallel. This environment is running special kinds of tests. These are mostly time travel tests where we manipulated time in the scope of tests and you couldn't time travel at two different rates in the same system because that, that would really screw things up. Um, and so each of those tests had a dedicated version of the application to time travel with. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a li that, that is a recording of a live run, test run, that we used to when, when we were building the software that managed the, the, the uh, test grid to, to optimize these things. So you can take this quite far. Um, and you can handle very large, very complex builds with these sorts of techniques if you want to go this, in this direction. Let's move on and talk about failing tests. The idea of continuous delivery, really, is to keep our software in a releasable state. And if any single test fails, our software is no longer releasable. So at the point of a test failure, we're now not releasable. So the job at that point is to get back to releasability as quickly as we possibly can. So the job of the development team in that situation the first part of the discipline really is that the person that committed the change that's responsible for the failure is responsible for correcting the failure. If I write a, te if I write a change and I commit something, it breaks one of your tests, that's my problem, not your problem. So I'm going to go and try and fix it as quickly as possible. There's some disciplines around this. I want me to be able to spot it before anybody else. Um, and, and so on. But fundamentally, my job now is as soon as I've broken something is to try and get back to a stable place. I usually recommend starting a clock from the point at which you detect a failure. Give yourself 10 minutes to commit something. And you either commit a fix or you revert your change. Don't spend ages trying to dis describe what the, the fix is. Revert it and then figure it offline if there's a problem, because you want to get back to getting the, the build into a releasable state. We've talked about the, um, uh, the, the time scales that we're looking for. We're trying to, we're trying to maintain that and, and, and be able to use that tool within the team. So prioritize fixing failing tests always when there's, a, when there's a failure. If somebody else commits a change and breaks it and they've gone home or gone away, revert their change on their behalf. Keep the build in a, in a releasable state. One of the most profound problems for these more bigger, more complex kinds of tests are intermittent tests. Um, and these are, always a, these, these are always difficult to deal with. Um, intermittency is painful and a difficult thing to stay on top of, but I think it's important to try and do so. Um, too many teams live with intermittency, in, intermittent tests. Um, it's, got, it's at the stage where some build tools, for example, will do things like give you the option to flick a switch and say, if a test fails, we'll run it again. What on earth does that mean? What's the point of that? If I run the test again, it's lying to me. It, it, one, if I run the test again and this time it passes, it's lying to me one of the times. Is it lying to me when it's passing or is it lying to me when it's failing? I don't know. I can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a race condition, but you don't know. You can't tell that. So it's, it's important to deal with the intermittency. So in the case in the case with the browser response, you've got to deal with you've got to deal with that. You've got to deal with, 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 with that kind of problem. Too many teams live with intermittent tests and spend ages analyzing is it okay to release with this failure or not? Or rerunning the test. Both of these are crazy. So don't live it with, with intermittent tests, solve the problem. Um, and 
treat intermittent tests as failing tests. It might be worth, we, we built some tools into our deployment pipeline that would track the history of the last 10 commits and would be able to spot patterns. If, if you, there's a particular test that went pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, or something similar, it had a high score on an intermittency index. And so it was a suspicious candidate that we'd then go and look at and try and figure out why it was doing that. Um, so treat intermittent tests as failing tests and don't allow the release of the software until you kind of got to the bottom of it. As a last resort, if your tests are intermittent, I think it's probably better to delete them, to leave them there just nagging at you because they're not telling the truth. The technical problem that you were referring to, if you've got nearly always intermittency is down to one of two things. It's a poorly written test that hasn't, in the case of the browser, it hasn't thought about the case that the browser might not be finished by the time it does the evaluation. So poll for the result until you get the result and then time out or not something else or look for a concluding event or something to, to determine when the evaluation is. Or there's a race condition in your application and that's a real, real world bug. So it's what, usually one of those two things. So either one is important to fix in my view. We, at LMAX, this was one of the things that we got wrong. We lived with intermittent tests and we built up all sorts of approaches to try and stay on top of them for a long time. And when we got down to it, we, we just started, let's dig in, we'll just always fix the intermittent test. Sometimes that took an off, a lot of work and a lot of effort because these are sometimes complex tests. But nearly always, if, they were, if it was a hard problem to find, it was a real bug in the application that was subtle and tucked away, but it could have caused problems. And we were glad that we found it when we did. The common causes of intermittent tests are race conditions, as I mentioned, poor test isolation, poorly designed test cases, and sometimes it's really something serious in the application that you ought to care about. The last on the list is pipeline changes. This is, as I said before, our deployment pipeline is a strategic resource. It's our route to production for all changes. And so maybe it's worth thinking about um, high availability strategies, clustering the systems for the pipeline, applying continuous delivery principles to your deployment pipeline, infrastructure as code principles, certainly. I have in the past for larger teams built a deployment pipeline for my deployment pipeline changes. It sounds a bit crazy, but it allowed me to evaluate my changes, be confident that I wasn't rolling out rubbish to the teams and to step back from the, the, the changes in the pipeline if, 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 they were, if they were bad. Think about service level agreements for the pipeline so that people know, you know that it's going to always be there and invest in you know, the hardware, software and practices to keep it, keep it available if it's um, central. The pipeline is a complex system in its own right and so we ought to be applying good engineering principles to it as well as to the rest of our software. Think of version controlling it and all of its tools. If you think about it, if we want to have a reproducible state in our system, the, deployment, the version of the deployment pipeline is a dependency of the system. So if I've got a particular version of the application and I'd like to recre recreate that older version of the application, I need to know what version of the build tools, the environment, the deployment pipeline was in play at the time when I originally built it. That's a bit of an extreme case. I confess I've not done that very often, but I have done it a couple of times in mission critical kinds of software systems. So it's worth thinking about. Consider writing test cases for some pipeline behaviors. You don't need to go to town and do this all of the time. But I've done some work with test-driven development for infrastructure as code, and it works surprisingly well. It's, it's not always easy to think about, but once you get into the, into the, into the, the way of working, it's, it's quite a nice, secure feeling when you're able to work with those sorts of changes that way. We can start thinking about blue-green deployment strategies for the pipeline. If you've not come across that concept, that's an idea that we wrote about in the continuous delivery book. The idea is that you have two environments, two production environments, in this case, two pipeline environments. One called blue, one called green, and the blue one's live. I'm going to provision and update the green one and get that ready for use, maybe test it. And when it's ready, I'm going to switch it over and make that one the, 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 the live one. And that just keeps 
the pipeline always available. Use infrastructure as code approach for all pipelines. I would advise doing this from day one. When you first build your pipeline, use infrastructure as code techniques to deploy it. Uh, and that way you're going to be, as you build it and it gets more and more complex, you can maintain that. And that's the easiest way to do these things. And using infrastructure as code, it means that all of this stuff is version controlled so you can step back to safety if you make a mistake. Too often, I've not done that. That's it. That's, the, that, that's my talk for today. Um, if you'll forgive me advertising my own wares, um, I'll be honest with you. So I, I, have, I have some online training courses that go into some detail on a lot of this stuff. Testing strategies in particular, but deployment pipelines, continuous delivery in general, they are very highly reviewed. It's difficult for me to sell them into India because of the differences in our economy. And I'd, I'd like to do that. I've tried advertising different price rates and so on. And if anybody ever asks, we'll give you, we'll give you a discount always. So if anybody's interested, anytime ask. But for, the, for, for, for this now, you can use any of my courses at a 50% discount um, for, uh, for, for the duration of the conference. So do take a look. Um, courses.cd.training and for the people that were particularly asking about acceptance testing there's a really good talk, course if you'll forgive me saying so myself about acceptance testing, how to build the infrastructure how to operate the process as I, dis as I sketched it today and how to do the test isolation stuff so you can run these things in parallel in your pipeline thank you very much I hope you continue to enjoy the conference and thank you for attending this today thank you Any questions? Uh, we have some time for questions. Anybody? Doesn't have to be about this stuff that we were talking about. Yes. So, um, in uh, one of my experiences, it has happened that due to some past experience, uh, there is a fear factor within the developers. So. Although, as you mentioned in acceptance tests, they should focus only on that particular use case, focus on that only. But because of past experience, they tend to do extra tests. So is it something which, is it a psychological thing and we have to deal it that way or is there a process by which we can handle such scenarios? I, I think, I, I, in my experience, it's commonly down to a few things. Um, and, and the first is that development teams are reticent to do test-driven development. And so they lean on these bigger, more complex functional tests, the BDD-style tests, the acceptance tests, as a, instead of test-driven development. I think that's a mistake. I think that you want the fine-grained validation that test-driven development gives you that's faster, quicker, cheaper to run, easier to produce those tests, easier, easier to maintain, and they have a better impact on the design of your software. Um, the acceptance tests are expensive, and you probably don't want to be testing every little possible edge case through them, which is why I, I prefer, you know, strategically, I want both. I want the value of the fine-grained detail in the test-driven development things and the acceptance tests. The other reason why people are nervous is that they haven't got good enough test coverage. Clearly, because otherwise they wouldn't be nervous. <laughs> so, um, so I think part of it is to try and build the culture of, of testing. Um, I, this is unpopular these days, but I think that pair programming, mob programming, ensemble programming, are a good way of trying to level up the culture in a team. Um, if, if I'm having a bad day and you and I are pairing and I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not testing now, you're going to say, no, 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 we should be doing the test. And you're going to make me do a better job. And when you're having a bad day, I'll make you do a better job. So you tend to level up. You tend to get a better, better result with that kind of thing. And that's particularly true when you're trying to change the culture of a team. I, I think it's a really valuable tool for doing that kind of thing. I do want to make the acceptance tests easy to write. And sorry, I'm not trying to advertise my courses. I suppose I am, but I'm not. But, but, the, but that's one of the big 
themes of acceptance test driven development and BDD is to try and make the test cases easy to write because these big functional tests are difficult to live with and you want to be able to make them easy to write so they go really fast and you make, make them reliable so you want great test infrastructure and you want the test cases themselves to be simple and easy to write. That does tend to lure you into overusing them so you have to be a bit wary of that. But I think that the real answer is to focus more on TDD rather than these things for that, really. Thank you. Pleasure. Anybody else? Great. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, sorry. There's one more question. Sorry. Uh, can you give an example about installer? An installer, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, it's just jargon that that, I, that Jez and I took to using for um, the build image, really. So, so what so what we want is that we want to we want to, as well as testing the behaviour of the system, we want to test its deployment as though it's in production. So we want to use the same techniques, the same technology, the same mechanism to deploy the software into test environments that we will use into production, and it should be automated. So that's the installer. So, so what we're talking about at the end of the commit stage is building the installable image, which I tend to refer to as a release candidate, which is the bits and bytes that we will deploy into production, and then any of the associated mechanisms that are going to get that image into place and up and running and ready for use. Okay? The, there's, there's some stuff talked about that in the continuous delivery book which I know that you've got a copy of because you asked me to sign it earlier. <laughs> so there's some, the, the, we do talk about some of that stuff in the continuous delivery book. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you.